It's lovely to see everyone. Uh, it's lovely to see everybody. Uh, there's quite a few faces and names that I recognize. Uh, so hello to those people that I recognize and a lot of people that I don't, but hopefully I will start to after tonight. Um, so just very quick little bit about me. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction there. Um, I'm Glenn Carter. I'm a primary school teacher up in the northeast of England and my school, Ingerby Mill Primary, um, we've been Mosaic Education's UK partner school for about three years now. Um, so as part of that kind of agreement, I, I, I often show people uh, sort of Mosaic Education's products and how best to use them. And that's kind of what we're doing tonight to try and raise their profile in the UK, because I genuinely feel like the things that they've got are absolutely amazing and that more people should be using them. So um, my kind of background is very much history. Um, so I run History Rocks. Uh, the website history-rocks.com and you can find it on Facebook as well History Rocks Creative Primary History um, and so my background is very much uh, history so tonight we're looking at history and geography because I'm also the geography lead um, in school as well and looking at sort of the tools and different ways that you can use Moore's book to bring history and geography to life in your lessons so I'm going to start sharing my screen now so you can see what a kind of typical kind of lesson might look like now the idea of tonight is to kind of show you how I would incorporate some of these kinds of features into some of the lessons. There are other features as well that I might use. It's just, you know, in the case of a single lesson, I might not put everything in, but there is a time and a place for everything where appropriate. So I'll start sharing my screen um, and then you can see what it is that we're doing. So as you can see, first of all, um, it works just like any other kind of interactive whiteboard software where you can create and customize what you want to do. So I've put a picture in there in the background just to kind of make things interesting. And then I've got uh, my title on there, Achievements in Ancient Egypt, which is kind of the lesson we're going to use for this demo. Um, now, some of you might have spotted that the font for this is actually the dyslexic font. And that's one of the big selling points for Mosbook is they have the dyslexic font built in. Um, if I look here, I could, I've got a list of fonts um, that I can choose from and dyslexic is one of them, which is uh, really, really useful for those uh, learners that, that struggle with reading things off the board. So the general kind of interface works, you know, I've got my sort of toolkit over here on the on the right hand side and there's various things and we'll go through some of these as it moves on. Um, but essentially I've got these two buttons down at the bottom which work a bit like a flip charty kind of thing where you can uh, move backwards and forwards between the pages. So I press this one and it moves onto the next page. So I've set out my little background here and the first thing we're going to do now a history lesson is recap on last lessons learning, because that's what we want to see. We want to revisit that learning. Now, to do that, I'm going to use one of the tools. I'm going to use the test editor for this. And there's a couple of ways that I can do it. I can insert an icon here um, and I can click on it and it will bring up the test. Now, I've fully created the content of this. I've taken uh, Moser Books test editor tool and I've created the content that I want to do with it. And um, the other thing I can do is I can have it as an interactive on here so that I don't have to load it up as a separate entity. I can have it as part of the page and manipulate it here. Um, so these little arrows kind of work like PowerPoint, um, which is a big feature for me. Um, in other interactive whiteboard software, you can't always do that. Sometimes you have to have like a, um, a bar that kind of reveals and disappears and you have to put boxes over them and kind of get rid of them, and move them and that kind of stuff. Whereas Moser book works a bit like PowerPoint, you can add animations to bring things in and get rid of them and play sounds and all that kind of stuff. So for me, something like this is really, really useful because it's just a very quick way of customizing the, the content that I want. So here we're going to look at, right, well, we've done a chronology lesson on uh, ancient Egypt. So, right, well, let's put these into order and I can get the children to come up and put them in order. So we've got Egypt being unified. We've got the Pyramid of Jossa being built. Alexander the Great invades and then the Romans invade and then Christianity comes to Europe. And you can mix these up. Now, at the minute, they should be in the, uh, in the right um, in the right place. We're going to move that across a little bit because uh, if I get rid of that, you can see I've got this little tick in the bottom corner here. When I do that, it then shows me what I've got correct and then what I've got incorrect. Um, and I've got a couple of questions that I want to do. So you'll see now that I've actually got a different style of questioning going on there. I can, I, and I can have as many questions as I want through the test editor. So for here, I've now got a, a kind of a multiple choice question. So who else was around at the time of the ancient Egyptians? And the children can come up and they can tap on the ones that are correct or incorrect. If I do the Vikings, I know that they weren't, but it'll tell me whether it was correct or incorrect. And I can see that and what my kind of result 
would be. And then the third exercise, um, I've got a timeline because that was the last thing we did. So um, with this, it's a case of dragging and dropping. So this one's already kind of been completed, but essentially this is what it would look like is I've created this, I've inserted an image onto there and then I've kind of placed these boxes as to as the answers. So we can go, right, tell me, where's the Stone Age? Right, show me, there's the Stone Age and it's sort of slide and snap onto where's the Bronze Age in Britain, right? It's there, so just drag that onto there. And I go through and, and obviously put the, uh, the, the correct answers in there. So it's just a nice, fun way of recapping that's interactive and I can do whatever it is that I want. To use that, um, I go to the tools and I've got the test editor here. And then here I get my sort of choice of what it is that I want to use. And I can have as many of these as I want. I can mix and match them. And it's really, really easy to do. Um, so if we do something like this, um, we can then start putting them in, match the pairs. So what I can do is I can say, all right, I want two different things. And I can go, all right, we'll have things that are Egyptian and maybe things that are Roman because we've learned about the Romans uh, beforehand. And then I can say, all right, well, we've got a pyramid, which would be Egyptian. Uh, we'd have gladiators which are Roman, and then we might have mummies, which are Egyptian. And then I just join up the things as they are. So I've got my Egyptians there, and I've got my gladiators there. And then when I'm happy with that, I can press save. And there we go. That's now ready for me to use um, in there. So then obviously I can get the children. You can see it's mixed them up as well, so it doesn't always stay the same. And then if I want another one, I just click on this again, and I just keep adding and adding and adding, pressing save, and there it is. And then to put that into my exercise book, I just go to the pin, I'm going to pin it in and insert it in whichever way I want. I can have a small icon, a large icon, as an image, or I can have it as that interactive so that it just kind of works on the screen. It's up to you, it's like however you want to do it. So if you just put a large icon there, you can see I've now got this one. So I've got as many um, as I want on there. So I'll just kind of get rid of that for the moment. Uh, oops, rid of that. Right, so we'll move on. So that's my kind of recap. I'm using some of the tools in Mosebook to recap. So now we're moving on to the kind of the actual lesson. So what do we think? Um, what do we think that the ancient Egyptians actually achieved? Um, and what we can do as well, I'm using it like PowerPoint to bring things in um, as and when I choose. Um, I can start putting videos in there because the whole point of Mosebook is that it's kind of one ecosystem, is that you can bring everything together without having to close PowerPoint down and open this up and minimize this and wait for this to load and what have you, is I can just do everything in here. Um, so for this, um, I've got a YouTube video, which um, if I just go to the um, insert button, I can do an online video and then I just take the link from YouTube, post it into there and it will pop it into here. So um, I'm just going to open that up now. Um, and there it is. The now ancient Egyptians were known for being in. I don't actually have to go onto YouTube. And one of the great things as well is that this automatically blocks adverts as well. So you don't get all the adverts. On YouTube, you don't have to worry about what's coming up next, so that's great. So obviously, we can watch it um, in here. I can just the click on ancient it. Egyptians were known for being innovative in, the uh, or I can watch it on YouTube. And if I click on the YouTube, it loads it up within Moza Book as well. Um, so I don't have to come in and out. I don't have to keep minimizing it and all that. Being innovative in their architecture, technology, and medicine. So then we would watch the video. Obviously, we're not going to sit and watch all the video now. Um, but then we talk about, right, well, we know that they managed to achieve a lot because that's what the videos told us. The first thing on the video was about their writing. So let's take a closer look at it. So now I've inserted a video that's actually been produced by Mosaic from their media content uh, library. So I'll just click on this and it should just start to load. So with this kind of video, I can look at different parts to it and I can start to get the children to engage with it. So we can look at, oh, right, well, what do we spot here in this bit? I'm just gonna turn the sound off for it whilst, we, um, whilst we're doing this. Um, so we can, um, I can say to the children, right, well, you tell me, what do you see here? Is that just all one language? Because it looks slightly different. Oh, right, well, there might be three different languages on there. When the next bit comes up and go, oh, have you ever seen these shapes before? Um, what, do they, what do you think it says? What do you think it represents? What, what's it on here? We can look at this bit and go, oh, we'll look at the, the kind of the borders here. It looks a little bit like a newspaper that it's set out. Again, we've got this language that's written on paper. And um, when we look at this, we go, right, well, what do you think this crack is here? What do you think these bits are there? 
Um, and then we can sort of take a look at this where there's kind of the translation go, ah, oh, is this starting to make a bit of sense now? How do we work out that this snake-like image is a D, Z or an S and why this sort of little hill shape is a K and this sort of little face is a H or an R? We can start asking all of those questions and that's there within the media library. If I go down to here, I've got the media library, I can start loading up videos, I can search for whatever I want in here so I can search for Egypt and there it is. And then I can just drag and drop into there. Um, it's really, really simple for me to do. Um, so then um, we can go, right, well, what do we notice about the writing? Is it the same as ours? Can you remember the name of that style um, that's been mentioned in the first video? And that's how I'm going to bring the key words into this, this vocabulary that we're going to be talking through in different lessons. So we've got the word hieroglyphics, and this is going to come into it a little bit later on. I'm going to show you one of the tools where we can test vocabulary a little bit. So we move on a little bit. So what examples do we have of their writing? Right, well, now this is the kind of thing that really separates Moore's a book from a lot of different uh, interactive whiteboard software out there is the 3D scenes. Um, so I've, in, um, I've inserted this 3D scene in here um, about the Rosetta Stone. And there's a couple of really cool features um, that are sort of unique to Moore's book with this. Not only do you get over 1,200 of these 3D scenes built in that I can interact with, and I can zoom in and out of, um, and I can uh, get some information up, about it, so it gives me various bits of information about it. Um, if I tap on these little stars, I get a little bit more information about them. I can take photographs of it as a screenshot if I want to. Um, I've got these different um, tabs at the bottom with little animations in there and different views of things. It's just fantastic. It just brings it all to life. And to me, this has been the biggest um, and had been the biggest thing and had the most impact in my school in engaging children and bringing history to life because that's kind of my motto is I want children to experience history if I could take them back in time to go and actually see this in the flesh then I would the paperwork and the health and safety of it would be an absolute nightmare but I'd love to be able to do it and for me this is about as close as we're going to get to things like these 3D scenes and one of the great things you can do with Moser book is this little icon here it's not available on all of the 3D scenes but what I can do is if I've got this um, in a kind of a minimized view, is if I click on this, I can now take elements of, uh, of the 3D scene and just drop them onto the actual um, exercise book that I'm working in. So I don't have to open the 3D scene up. I can just have it here. If I just want one part of it, I can zoom in and out. We can just have it here so we can interact with it, uh, which is fantastic. And you can open up the 3D scenes fully if you wanted uh, to investigate it more. So we talked about the Rosetta Stone being one of the biggest and best discoveries ever made from ancient Egypt as it unlocked the secrets of the hieroglyphics. And then again, I've got another uh, clip from Mosaic themselves all about the Rosetta Stone, which helps um, explore it a bit further. So we've got the sound off at the minute. It's just, uh, it's just some music playing in the background there. But what we can do is say, right, well, where is the Rosetta Stone now? Does anybody recognize where this is? And most people go, oh yeah, it's the British Museum, right? And then we can talk about well, why is this Egyptian artifact in the British Museum? How on earth did it get there? This is the actual thing. This is the actual Rosetta Stone. Look at how busy it is. That means that it must be significant. If people are going to see it, we've got all of these people all crowding around it, taking pictures of it, pointing at it, listening to stories about it, that kind of stuff, then it must be important in some way, shape or form. And what we can do here, what I really like about this kind of element is that the next part is we can say, right, how have they managed to create the 3D model of it? Well, we can say, well, we know that Mosaic have had access to it as a primary source because they've captured this video. So the 3D scene is a secondary source that's used the primary source as its evidence to make it. So we can talk about source work in there in, in with these 3D scenes going, well, they are um, 3D scenes that are secondary sources, but where they got that from. Um, I know that I've done a bit of work with Mosaic in creating some uh, 3D scenes and giving them the information so that they can bring them to life. And that's me sending them. So there was one about Captain Cook. And um, we've got the Captain Cook Birthplace Museum about 10 minutes away from where I live. I went and got a bunch of information from, uh, from there, uh, taking photographs, uh, diagrams and that kind of stuff so that Mosaic could use that information to then make a copy, a 3D scene of uh, James Cook's Endeavour ship. So you can talk about the fact that a lot of these 3D scenes are actually using primary source material as uh, their evidence. And now we've got another keyword in there, we've got the Rosette Stone. So what else did they manage to accomplish other than writing? Well, 
they built huge temples like the Great Pyramids of Giza and the Temple of Abu Simbel. So now I've got two more 3D scenes to bring it all, all to life. And we won't go through them, through them all. Um, you feel free to go through them at your own leisure. Um, but for me, this one, the, the Temple of Abu Simbel, I showed this to my children last year when we were doing our Egyptian topic, and it just blew their minds, absolutely blew their minds, because we spent about 15 to 20 minutes just on the 3D scene alone because they had so many questions and we got so much information from it. And it really helped hit home how significant the Egyptians were. So when we start looking at this 3D scene here of the, the Temple of Abu Simbel in here, and we start pulling up some of the information about it, we start to appreciate just how amazing this thing actually was. So when we take a look at the Great Temple here, what we, uh, we found some information out about that these statues of Ramesses were about 20 meters tall. Um, so we got the, the, we got the meter sticks out in our room and we started stacking them going, this is taller than the school and this is carved into the rock. And then we can actually show them what this looks like and getting them to kind of imagine what it was and we go, all right, well, that's not enough. Let's go inside this temple and we go, all right, look at these people. These are ordinary sized people. And these statues here are about 10 meters tall. Right, well, let's get the, let's get the uh, measuring sticks out. Let's get the meter sticks out again. How tall is that? That's taller than the school as well. And these are made out of stone. And there's eight of these massive statues. And we can see just how enormous these are and start to figure the scale of this temple here. And going, well, this is just one temple in there. And we can go even further. We can go into the inner sanctuary and start looking at all the things that are on the wall um, and the language that's in there and how much this must have meant to uh, sort of to the Egyptians and how important these people would have been. And in a lot of the scenes, you can actually walk about as well. So I'm just using the keyboard here. If any of you are gamers, I'm just using W, A, S, and D and holding shift to, uh, to run about a little bit. Or if you haven't got that, you can just use the arrow keys in there, or you can use this um, joystick that's actually on the screen as well, if you're not confident with that. So you can actually bring everything to life. And to me, that is one of the biggest features of... Um, of Moser book is being able to, to bring history to life. You just have a quick look at the pyramids. There are exercises that you can actually generate from these 3D scenes. Some of them are, are, are a bit more useful than others, um, just in terms of the content that's there and sort of the appropriateness for things like primary school, but you can do it. Um, there's like nice labeling kind of activities in there or sort of mix and match kind of thing. So if I click this button down here, um, I can generate the exercise. So if I click on it here, I can do the single selection and I can generate it. Um, and then it loads up kind of like the test editor from there. So then it'll um, load up the exercise for me here. It's having a think and we can go, right, well, what do we see here? What's this one here? Can we remember what that actually was? Um, or we can do some labeling in there. I can generate the label. It takes a couple of seconds just because we're on Zoom at the minute it's recording as well. So, this one, we've got some labeling in here. We can go, right, well, which one is Caffrey's pyramid? There we go. And then we can test it and go, ah, oh, there we go, correct. Um, so there's a few, a few different things that you can do uh, with that. Uh, like things like the matching are quite nice as well. We can match the different labels up with the different things. And you can do this across the different tabs along the bottom as well. And it just kind of automatically generates it. So you can start you know, putting these together. I'm just guessing that these, um, and then obviously we just, Go, oh, right, never mind. We've got none of them right. Never mind. But hey ho. Um, and then again, with this one, I can um, put some of these temples onto Moser book and I can put the Sphinx onto my actual exercise book if I just kind of wanted them there to sort of twizzle around and investigate without loading up the entire scene. Um, and then, oh, this is one of the cool things as well. Um, let's see when these were actually built, right? So we found out a bit of information about them. And one of the, the great tools on Moser book is the time machine. This might take a couple of seconds to load up just because there's so much information on it. But essentially what this is, is one enormous timeline um, of some of the most important people in the world. Um, and it, you can see it's taken a couple of seconds just to load up there, right? So here we've got Khufu and Khafra here who, are, who helped build uh, some of the first pyramids. And we've got Jossa there or Jossa um, who built some of the first step pyramid. But what I love about this, um, I don't know whether you can see just at the top there, um, we've got the dates on there, which goes from what, it's about 2,600 there with Khufu and Khafra. And as we're moving along, what's really interesting is sort of this position here of Tutankhamun and Ramesses II, because the two people that most children will know from the Egyptians, are Tutankhamun and Cleopatra, some of them might know about Ramesses, 
but most of them know about the Tomb of Cameron and Cleopatra. And what this tool is great at doing is showing just how far apart they were. So we've got Tutankhamun here. And if I click on him, I get a bit of information about him. And if I click the eye, I get a little bit more information. There's a link to his Wikipedia page. And I'll come on to that one in a second. But what it's great for is showing how these two are actually so far apart. We've got Tutankhamun there. And if we move along, we've now got, uh, oh, where is she? she uh, I need to open that up a little bit. There's more um, on there. We've got, where is she gone? Oh, might have to go down a little bit more. There she is. Just at the bottom there, Cleopatra, just at the bottom there, we can go, all right, well, did they actually know about each other? No. Tutankhamun would have had no idea who Cleopatra was. Cleopatra might have known about Tutankhamun uh, from, from the past. But what this is also great for doing, because certainly in my school, when we do about the Egyptians, we've already learned about the Romans, is we look at comparing the Romans and Egyptians. And what's really fascinating is when we look at someone like Tutankhamun, is going, would he, would he, would he have known anything about the Romans? Well, no, because we've got Romulus and Remus here, the start of Rome. So they, they are well after Tutankhamun. But having something like this really emphasizes that, it really shows that. Um, and going, right, well, would Cleopatra have had any links with Rome? And we go, well, yeah, here, look, all of these Romans were around at exactly the same time as Cleopatra or before or afterwards. So we can see that they may well have known about each other. So if I click on Cleopatra and I click this one, it now puts her at the center of all of her sort of contemporaries and people that would have been linked to her. Um, so we can start to see the connections between people. If I click on this, I can look at the different parameters. So if I want to look at different monarchs, which are sort of the, the green one, I drag this to here, and then I put these other ones, these other sort of uh, content labels, as far away from each other, so that now you can see that it's all moving about. So now I've got all of these different monarchs and kings and queens who are now closer to us, so we can explore that. Or if I just wanted Egyptians, I could do the same thing. Who were the? Who are all the Egyptians? So I make the red um, sort of on its own, I move that to there, and now we can start to see all the Egyptians who were close to each other. And if we press this button, we can start to see all of the different links between different people that Cleopatra uh, is linked to Ramses in one way or another. She's linked to Tutankhamun because she was a queen and he was a, he was a, a pharaoh. Um, so there's lots of different ways that all of these people would know each other. We can start to investigate some of those if we wanted to, um, or we can go back to just kind of knowing the names of them and the, uh, the, different, uh, the different pictures of them. So for me, this is a really, really valuable tool that you can just kind of load up in an instant. And then now we've got the words pyramid and temple and our key words. We're kind of bringing that in all the time, recapping that language. So what else did they do? Well, they did lots of things, right? Well, they were great with medicine. And I'm introducing another tool here, the gallery tool, which is just a series of pictures that I've kind of curated um, onto here. So we can look through and go, all right, well, what does this show? So instead of just having pictures sort of popping up on Moore's book all the time and sort of cluttering everything up, I can just put them in a gallery, which makes it a bit easier for me. And we can look through this. We've got these sort of medical texts in here. We can look at mummification. We've got tools in there. We've got sort of dentistry in there. And it's really easy to add your own stuff to the gallery. Okay, so all I have to do is have my gallery tool open. And when I go to the media tool here and I go to image, um, I've got different options at the top. So it's just loading the catalog here. Um, and it's loading up Egypt. So Moza Book itself and Moza Web have their own catalog of things. But if I go to this one here, it will now start searching the internet. So if I search for um, Egyptian medicine on here, it's taking a little while just because we're on Zoom and we're doing this kind of thing. Um, but then all I have to do is just drag and drop the picture onto here. Oh, it's missing at the minute because it's loading it up. But it would just kind of drag and drop onto there and plunk, and plunk it in. For me. Um, so if we go back to some of the Moser book ones, uh, if we just do Egypt, just to show that works. Um, so we've got uh, an Egyptian painting, we've got an Egyptian pap papyrus on here. If I just drag and drop that in, it'll now just add that to my gallery in there. And I can do that with any and all that I want to do. And I can make this gallery as big or as small as I want, um, which is great. So I've got another one in there about farming with the Nile. So I've got all my pictures to do with the Nile farming in there together and obviously we can explore what's going on here we can look at the different canals that are going in there um and a bit later on there's uh, there's a 3d scene about agriculture in the nile which is great to bring it up to life um but then 
I'll talk a little bit about papyrus, uh, the paper, and how that was traded all around the Mediterranean to people like the Greeks and the Romans. And I've included another um, tool in here, a, ge a geography tool, which we'll explore a little bit further in the next part of this. Um, this is the mini map. And essentially what I've got here is I've got all the countries of the world. So we're saying, right, well, they traded um, this papyrus all around the Mediterranean. And we go, well, why is that? Why did they trade to people like the Romans and the Greeks? So we've got Egypt here and going, well, there's Greece, there's Italy. That's how they would have got this link. It's just across the sea. Um, or they could have gone through the various linked countries to different places. But it's just a really quick way of being able to show, well, why did they trade with these people? It's really visual. There we go. I've got it. It's here. Um, and all I've done is loaded up the countries of the world uh, tab. So if I go back to the beginning here of the minima, if I just click on the, an ocean somewhere, it gives me Earth. I click on countries of the world. Um, and I've got all these various options that I can include as well. If I want to, I don't have to. Click them on and off. If I want to, I could even just take all these off and go, can anybody tell me where Egypt is? Um, or where is Greece? Where is Italy? Put these on. And then wherever I'm set with it, if I want this kind of image um, to load up, all I do is whatever state I'm in here, if I go on my pin um, and do the, the insert the large icon, that's what it will do. That's what it will load up. Um, if I add something to it, so say I do a little bit of drawing on there and I kind of go, oh, there's Egypt in there and there's Italy in there and there's Greece. Um, and then I save this. The next time I load it up, whatever I've, um, whatever state it's in, just give it a second and there it is. So it's loaded up in that state. So you can pre sort of make everything before time, which is great. So now we've got uh, papyrus and trade. And this is where we're now going to test those keywords. All those keywords that we've learned, we're going to test them with the cards tool. Um, so I've now created these different cards to test the vocabulary. So what was the form of writing using pictures? If I then go to the top, if I click on the top, it's hieroglyphic. So I can test them if I click on the sides, it moves to the, um, to the next type of um, the next word. So I've got a type of early paper. Right, what was it? It was papyrus. Built for the pharaohs in the afterlife. What was it? Oh, it's the pyramids. An Egyptian stone with writing on it. Ah, it was the Rosetta stone. The main river in Egypt is the Nile. So I can just go through these at my leisure. I mean, it's really easy to create. So all I have to do is go to the tools icon and then I just go to the um, cards tool on there and it looks a bit like this. Um, so you just create one side of the card and what the other side is going to be. You can put pictures on there as well. You can, um, you can have, you know, what is this picture? Tell me what this picture is or give me an explanation of this picture. So it's really easy to do. It's just a really fun way of getting them to explore the different vocabulary. So this is where I would then kind of talk about the task and what it is that we were going to do. Now, I'm not going to talk pretty much about the task because I'm not really using kind of more as a book to do the task in this instant. We're doing the diamond nine, which is great kind of reasoning. Um, but essentially that would be sort of what I used on a day-to-day -day basis for history um, with Moser book and those kinds of tools. Um, if anybody's got any questions or anything they'd like to say, pop it in the chat if it's related to the history. And obviously we'll monitor that and come across it um, and answer those questions uh, towards the end. So I just want to quickly move on to geography and how I use this with geography. So again, we've got these lovely kind of backgrounds. I love these little sort of cartoony backgrounds in there. And we might be looking at sort of the major countries of Europe. I'm a year four teacher, and that's one of the things that we study in year four is sort of the major countries of Europe. So let's recap on what we already know about Europe. And again, we're doing that kind of recap, but what I'm gonna do here is instead of just using the test editor, I'm gonna use the board games. And my kids love the board games on this, absolutely fantastic. You can create your own games with them, and there are a number of different uh, games that you can do. So I always use the edit worksheet uh, option. If I click on it down here, because this is where I can create my own quiz. And I've put all of these questions on there. And we've got the different question types down the bottom. We've got a multiple choice uh, with the green and the white tick. We've got to type your answer. So maybe you want to test the spellings on certain things. A true or false, tell me the answer. And then we've got to picture one on there. So it might be, right, tell me what picture this is. Now, when I've got this selected, I then choose the type of game that I want. So um, if we went with, say, spin the wheel, the wheel of fortune kind of game, I'm now testing those 34 questions um, on those children. We've got two teams. And what I do is I split the class into two. We might have boys versus girls, or we might have front row versus back row, or these three tables versus these three tables, one at a time, that kind of thing. 
but the children can come up and they can use it themselves. So, right, here we go. Um, we'll put some sound on for it so we can see what that sounds like. Right, blue team, we're going to go first. We spin the wheel and for a whopping 600 points, tell me what is the capital of Greece? Oh, it's Athens, right? If they get that right, I click on the ticket. If they don't, I click on the cross. They got that right. Hooray, they got 600 points. Right, let's look at something else. We get uh, for 400 points, which country is this? So I've used the kind of the image tool on this. So we go, right, well, which country is it? Right, it's, uh, it's France. There we go, right move on and then we can do various things and obviously we can keep this going for as long or as short as we want from france which direction is germany it is uh northeast there we go um i'll get one wrong so you can see what that looks like um so what is the capital of england right well if you just went to say edinburgh which to be honest most children you know might not know the answer to anyway it goes mm. we get that kind of sad sound never mind um but with the uh the spin the wheel game you've got the joker in there as well which gives them i think it's about 200 points and another go and then you've got the bomb which they lose i think it's about 100 points um and it passes over so the kids love that but what i love as well is that you can use those same questions and just change the game that you want to do so here we've got battleships which is fantastic so i've still got the same questions um choose a square and then what is the capital uh, copenhagen is the capital of the ukraine false right Go, oh, we missed something. Right, red team. Oh, we got the joker. Did the joker go they missed? Right, here we go. Blue team. Let's see if we can find something. Which of these landmarks would you not find in Italy? There we go. That's, that's the capital. Yeah, right. Um, right, what about this one? Uh, what is the capital of the Republic of Ireland? Uh, Dublin. Yes, correct. Oh, we found something. Right. Then we carry on and we keep playing that. So the kids absolutely love those ball games and just a really fun, interactive way of testing that knowledge of recapping. And again, I can have it as an interactive or I can have it as the kind of a separate tool. Um, now, let's take a look at Europe on a globe. So I'm using the, the globe tool um, on here, which is like another 3D scene, which is fantastic. Instead of kind of all crowding around uh, a, a, a globe in your classroom, um, I can just get a huge one on the board. Now, of course, having globes in the classroom, getting the children to actually locate things is great. But... If you want them to see something all together and you've only got, say, one globe in your classroom, well, use something like this instead. So we've got this beautiful, um, beautifully controlled globe um, on here, and I can, I can view it in different ways. So we can look at the continent on here. So now, um, if I put the labels on, we can go, right, Europe. Let's look at the size of Europe compared to other continents. Is it the biggest? Is it the smallest? How many times would it fit into it? What does it look like? What shape? What's it connected to? Which kind of seas lie around it? Um, and then I can also go on to the um, countries too, so we can look at the different countries within there and sort of see the, bo uh, the borders and the barriers in there. We can look at uh, sort of where Europe is in terms of uh, the different tropics and the equator in there and going, right, well, what kind of climate would we expect in Europe or might there be multiple because of the size of it? And um, what about these countries down here compared to these countries up there? Or what I could get them to do is if I go to the countries tab here, is now we can actually um, look and go, all right, well, let's tell me which country is which. We can do a quick quiz on there. We can go, all right, here's Europe. Which country is this? You can click on it and it should load up and go, all right, it's Poland. What's its capital? And this is its flag as well. What's this one here? Oh, it's France. And we can start loading all that kind of stuff, which is great. Um, we can talk about the different lines of latitude and longitude. And uh, we can also see it on its actual tilt as well. So you can do whatever you want with it. Um, this is one of my favourites, is seeing the Earth at night. I love seeing this one um, because you can really start delving deep into things like populations and where there are sort of huge clusters of population. So we can look at somewhere like Africa and go, right, where are those clusters of populations? We can see somewhere like Egypt, we can see sort of just lit up uh, throughout the night. And we can see all of Europe here just lit up in the UK, and, um, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely fantastic for doing it. And they've also got some historical maps as well. Um, so you can look at the shapes and sizes. Different countries will look at the UK in there and go, right, well, how has that changed? Oh, look at the shape, look at the size of it. To when we get to this one in the 1800s, oh, that looks more like it. Why wasn't it like this in 1587? Did our country change shape or is it just our experience of what we knew about it at the time? So then we can take a look um, at a map of Europe. So we're using the mini map again, and I've um, sort of, curated this i've put the different features on so i've taken the map of europe on here and i've decided right i don't want the settlements the transport of the islands on just yet but obviously i could do if i wanted to i just want the countries on there and i can create exercises 
from this. Um, so I can create a new exercise. And one of the exercises that I've got is a labeling exercise on there. So I've, I've created this myself using the exercise tool. And then we can start um, putting different labels on where they've got to start matching them all around um, onto there. And then we can check them and decide which ones are which. So it's, it's quite nice um, to see and to use. Um, and then we talk about looking at the different shapes to help remember them. So the UK looking a bit like an old woman on a pig. We can see that kind of thing is a bit daft, but you know, it's just something to help and remember. Right, well, let's compare some statistics then of some of the major European countries. So for this one, we're using the um, countries tool, which is just in the toolbar here. Um, so we've got the um, countries one there. And what I love about this tool is it's got every country pretty much in the world. But the thing that I love most is that it gives me the same information about every country because there's been so many opportunities where I've gone, right, you're going to go use an iPad or use a tablet or a laptop and research a country. And I want to know its population, its size, highest mountains, longest rivers, all that kind of stuff, whatever it is. And one website won't have all of the countries and all that information. I'll need three or four different websites that have all got slightly different bits of information on there. Whereas I know this is going to give me the same information for every country that I choose on there. So we can see it's going to tell me the continent, the capital, the government, the religion in there, the area of it, the population, every country, if I go to Moldova, it gives me exactly the same types of information, which is exactly what I want. Now I can sort um, this information out here. Um, I can change it by clicking on this. We've got the population. So we look at the largest and the smallest. Um, I can change that by clicking on this one and going, right, well, which country has got the highest point? Right, well, we can see it's Finland has got the highest point in all of these countries. Oh, it hasn't. No, of course it hasn't. Russia has. Um, that was at the bottom there. Um, population, what's got the biggest population? Of course, Russia. Russia's bigger and better with everything. Uh, we've got the area. Life expectancy. Oh, we're not going to come to life expectancy. 94 and 86. Right, all of us are now moving to Monaco because we're going to live a little bit longer. We'll start using more of the But what I can do is the country that I'm on, if I click this button here, I can see where it is in the world in a little globe. Um, which is fantastic. Or I can have a look at it as a kind of like a fact card if I want to make it a bit clearer. And what I've kind of done in the past is I've used um, screenshot tools to take a screenshot of this, print it out, and then give it to the children so that they can work from it. You know, if I've got a set number of countries, right, we're going to look at these eight countries or these 10 countries, or you can choose from these 20 countries, take a screenshot, print it out, and there you go. They've got their own information cards rather than them having to um, go online and go through various different websites where actually you're not sure you're going to get all of the information. So that's where we then move on to the different, um, the different tasks that I ask them to do. We're going to label different parts of the countries, uh, the different countries of Europe and building on from that kind of um, uh, the, the exercises that we've done previously, how much have they retained? And obviously I could do kind of the, uh, the vocabulary again, um, if I wanted to with the, the different tools on there and the, the, the word tool on there, if I wanted to and test them. And then what I would usually do is some sort of plenary is like use the test editor or the board games just to kind of bring it all back together again. Now, what I love um, about Moza Book and Mosaic Education is all the content is there and it just allows you to mix and match everything. And the fact that the content is there, it's built in, means that you don't always have to go searching for it. You don't have to go, right, well, I want these three different websites because I want this, this part of it here and that part over there. I can have it all on here and I don't have to go on different uh, programs. It's all just there for me, um, which I love. And I love the fact as well that this isn't just aimed at one curriculum. It's aimed at a whole number of different curriculums as well. So. Obviously, I'm from the UK, so there's a lot of UK content on there. And I know that I've been working with Mosaic to try and um, introduce even more content on there as well uh, for the UK curriculum. But there's a lot of different sort of nationalities, a lot of different countries. I know we've got a lot of people from a lot of different countries on tonight. Um, it's, it's great for your curriculums as well. And that's what they tend to do is produce content that's going to be great for lots of different curriculums around the world as well, which is, which is fantastic. And it allows you to explore different cultures and different things that you might never have thought of looking at. So essentially that's kind of what I've got to show tonight um, is that those are some of the tools and, and games and things that I would use within my own lessons, which I find really engage the children.
Um, so that leaves us about 15 minutes to ask any questions, um, whether you want to put them in the chat or whether you want to kind of unmute um, or raise your hand um, on there and, and, and say that you want to ask a question or whatever it is. Um, and I'd be happy to help. Or there's the guys from uh, Mosaic if you want to ask any sort of technical kinds of questions, that kind of thing. I'm sure they'd be happy to help. Um, but uh, Mara, I'm happy to hand over back to you um, and to stop sharing my screen. Hi, yeah, thank you very much, Graham. This was amazing, absolutely. Um, if you have any technical questions, as Glenn mentioned, we are here for you to answer anything. Um, once again, I want to remind you to fill out the questionnaire. Adam, could you um, share the questionnaire once again? Okay, there it is. It's just a couple of questions. This is really the only way how we can reach you later on with the tryout cards. Thank you, Marva, for the nice words. Yeah, fabulous, great. I think your country is absolutely phenomenal. And I love the content that, um, that Mosaic have produced so that we can say how amazing ancient Egypt was. That was one of the things that, that sort of really introduced Mosaic to me, was finding all of that Egyptian uh, content. So don't forget um, to go to the Google form that's been posted in the chat, uh, put your details in there and um, Mosaic will be in touch with your three month free uh, license of Mosabook. And then there's going to be a bigger competition for a year's um, license as well. I think we're giving away three, is it three licenses? Exactly. Three one year licenses are in the, in the hat as well for a draw. So we are very excited for this opportunity. Yeah, and Glenn, this was a brilliant presentation. I got really excited to learn about history once again and learn more. Okay. Philippa, I'm quite happy to have a, a chat with you. I'll put you in touch with the guys um, who obviously would sort of facilitate. I know we've had a couple of conversations online. I'm more than happy to sort of put you in that direction with those guys um, so that you get a get an answer from them about the about potential costs. Because I think things, there's a different license that's coming out, um, which sort of alters the cost, but it makes it a bit more accessible. Yeah, if anyone interested in, in, in like a full licensing system or talk with any of our sales representatives, you can write to hello at mozabweb.com and we will come back to you and we can custom, uh, create a custom offer for you, especially for your school and for your needs depending on the size of your school, the devices that you are using. So everything is customizable. <laughs> okay, guys, we will leave uh, the link once again in the chat. So you have it. And then in a couple of minutes, we're going to stop the presentation and we will say goodbye to you. Thank you, Sean Celestine. Thank you for coming.
but uh, an interesting question there about whether it works on Chromebooks or not, or does it need a, a Windows system for it? Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for your technical question. So currently, Mozabook uh, supports Windows uh, systems. Uh, Chromebook could work, but uh, that's not going to be the fully featured version of Mozabook. So we have native applications for both iOS and both Android and for Android as well. And those applications we have work on Chromebook, but the fully featured version of Mozabook, for that you need a Windows uh, operating system. Okay, guys, thank you for everyone for being here. We're going to stop the presentation now and the webinar comes to an end. So have a nice evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for Glenn once again. And yeah, goodbye. See you soon. Follow us on Facebook, follow Glenn on Facebook and hope to see you in the next one. Okay, bye-bye.